Um, so, Lucky, uh, sorry, Zaki Ladi. The floor is yours. Zaki. Okay. Uh, Lucky, I, I, is it Lucky? Sorry, my. my, my Zaki is my first name, Ladi is my last name. Of course, name. okay. <laughs> my apologies. Uh, okay, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here once again with virtually the same panelists. Uh, to discuss the same topic. So I would like to introduce a kind of uh, dynamic interpretation. And in a nutshell, I will tend to say that nothing has changed since last year, but virtually everything could change. Uh, nothing has changed because we are confronted, and Ukraine is confronted to a violent uh, Russian aggression which will unfortunately enter its uh, third year next February, which is probably longer than we all expected. The second point, and it had been mentioned by uh, Bogdan, the European support is stronger, and is stronger than ever, and this point should be stressed. Uh, all in all, all in all, we have committed I mean, I'm, I'm talking about commitment, not disbursement, which are lower. But in terms of commitment, we are around 80 billion euros for Ukraine. Uh, through different mechanism, uh, I'm not enter into detail. And uh, for the first time, our commitments are higher than the American ones. So, and I would like to insist on this because I had many distinction with the Keele Institute, who constantly insisted on saying that the American commitment was uh, much more important than the European one. And at the end of the day, they realized that our commitments were extremely important, and they actually corrected the figures, and they came to the figure that the European commitments were the higher. Of course, I'm not comparing the United States with, uh, with Europe, because virtually we are absolutely on the same line, fortunately. But uh, it's important to say that we are on the forefront. And it, this idea matters if some uh, unfortunate changes take place in uh, the United States in the, in the next uh, future. So the other achievement is that the level of consensus among Europeans is, is still very strong important, with, of course, some uh, caveats, but by and large is extremely uh, strong. And uh, the reason why uh, it is strong, it's because all European states see in Ukraine a challenge to their security and see in a unfortunate success of Russia, which I cannot uh, imagine, a, a huge uh, blow to our uh, security. And even countries of Europe, which were, let's had a, 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 a well, south-oriented, south uh, are now changing their views and, let's say, pivoting towards Central, uh, central Europe. So this is a huge change which will uh, take place in the uh, two next uh, decade. So Russia, unfortunately, is and will remain a security threat to Europe. And this view is now shared massively by the uh, European. Uh, two main achievements from the European side which have to be uh, mentioned and uh, reaffirmed uh, we succeeded in putting an end to our energy dependency vis-a-vis -vis Russia, which is a huge achievement. And second, uh, we are probably now on the verge of transferring the frozen assets, uh, Russian assets, uh, to Ukraine. I hope that we will be able to uh, give them the 300 uh, billions of Russian assets which had been frozen. So, in, that, in a sense, everything is fine. But, there are but. Uh, the first, and we have to confess, and even uh, from my personal uh, perspective, 
uh, the military situation is uh, difficult and much, much more difficult than what expected compared, for example, to last year. The costs incurred by Russia are absolutely huge, huge, uh, and by Western standards or European standards, they are unbearable, unbearable. And if you see the last months in October, uh, the casualties on the Russian side were absolutely huge and among the, 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 the most important casualties within a month. So they are losing, they are losing. Now, what is unbearable by European standards is perfectly bearable by Russian standards. And we have to take this into account. And you need, in this regard, to read the formidable uh, interview piece written by the uh, chief of staff of Ukraine, uh, General Zelensky in uh, The Economist, which uh, is not extraordinarily optimistic uh, on the evolution of the situation. And in fact, uh, Putin is following, unfortunately, what uh, Stalin said in the past, uh, when he said that to a certain extent, to a certain extent, and I'm sorry because the sentence is terrible, quality, quantity becomes a source of quality. But that's the way uh, Russia behaves. So people are killed en masse, but they are killed and new waves of soldiers arrive. And the problem is that the uh, Ukrainians cannot work on the same footing. So there is an inequality. Uh, so, uh, to, to um, stop on, 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 on this, so just to say that's going to be a long war, much probably longer than expected, and there is no doubt, there is no doubt that, uh, of course, a kind of fatigue may appear in Europe, but also uh, in, the, uh, in the United States, where the news are not uh, terribly, uh, terribly good, but which will bring, uh, will put the Europeans in front of, of their responsibility. So I will come, if you allow me, later on, on the interaction which seems to me extremely important between what's going on in Ukraine and what's going on in the Middle East. Thank you very much. Uh, it is important to point out that the European support has, has been extraordinary. Uh, U.S. support as well. It's, uh, I think you, Ukraine has, has emphasized that as well. The, um, the interview that you referred to in The Economist, uh, I highly recommend if, if any of you uh, are interested in this topic, reading further into it. Uh, the, the term that's used in that interview quite a bit is stalemate. And I was, I was rather surprised to hear the, the chief of staff referring uh, openly to that. Um, but we'll, you know, we'll hope to come back to, to those points you were making. Thank you very much. Uh